Hey, welcome to Lenny Schmidt's Quarantine Comedy. Thank you uh, for tuning in. Thank you for being here. This is the show where we talk to live performers, singers, writers. That wouldn't be a really a live performer. But singers, actors, uh, dancers, musicians, and a lot of comics, comedians. Uh, we talk to them about their careers, um, what they did before COVID, how they're adjusting to COVID, what they're going to do moving forward. Uh, the uh, uh, COVID has shut down the live entertainment industry completely across the board. This gives everyone an opportunity to catch up with their favorite performers and the performers an opportunity to share some product, some merch, some albums, so forth, and get some support uh, while we're going through this, uh, this COVID thing. So thank you for being here. If you enjoyed the show, do me a favor, like the video first. Number one, most important, please like the video. It helps me immensely also share the video if you really like the show share the video subscribe to the channel that also that helps a lot as well that goes really far with youtube it helps us stay uh helps me to put shows up and get more attention on uh, youtube also if you want to support the show financially if you want to uh throw some money at the show uh there's a couple of options for you bam they're right above my head right there look at that look at that you can go to lenny schmidt.com slash if you can that's my website you can venmo me at lenny schmidt comedy uh, and you can join my Patreon page, which I'll talk about later in the broadcast. Um, you can do a monthly fee. You can pay as little as a dollar on all of those options. If you enjoy the show, you enjoy the content, the interview, uh, with the white noise, whatever you're doing with the show in the background, uh, you can throw a buck at it, wherever you think it's worth. Just a dollar. It's simple. Just a dollar. You have an option between a dollar and $10,000. There's an actual $10,000 button on my website. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how many people have used it, uh, but it rhymes with the word zero. Anyway, please feel free uh, to throw some money at the show. We'd appreciate it. We don't have any sponsors. The show is totally sponsored by and supported by all of the people that watch the show and some of the entertainers that have been on the show as well. Uh, so I can't thank you uh, enough. So sit back, enjoy the show, enjoy today's episode, and uh, we're going to start it uh, right now. This is taped. It won't be taped in a second. This is going to be live. Um, here we go. Enjoy the show. Thanks for being here. Take care. I love that song. Dude, I don't even know what it is. It's not a real song. You're aware of that, right? Yeah, it was one of the uh, copyright songs I was able to... Uh, there's no copyright with that. Hi, everyone. What's up? Welcome to Lenny Schmidt's Quarantine Comedy. Um, it's a little different today. I'm on the road. Some of you guys know that. In fact, I know Larry knows that because he was at my show in Oklahoma City two nights ago. So, Larry, thank you very much for driving up uh, to uh, catch my show two and a half hours. Uh, and you're welcome uh, because you want 800 bucks in a casino. So, hey, Ray's here. Larry's wife is even here. Oh, good. And now people are calling me. This is exactly the way this goes. Let me turn this off. It's good to be here, guys. I'm in Oklahoma City. It's a little different for me uh, with the show and the setting up because I usually have a couple of monitors and a couple of other things. This is bare, this is bare bones, man. So I'm expecting numerous mistakes because that's, that's how I roll. Uh, I think you guys know that. I made quite a few mistakes. So we'll see if that happens. But uh, I'm having fun out here on the road. I'll be honest with you, man. I was worried about remembering my act and remembering jokes and doing stuff. But uh, hell, I don't want to brag, but Wednesday's show was a little uh, choppy. But then Thursday, it was like I, I didn't miss a beat. I picked right up. I remembered everything. I don't know how. I haven't done a show in seven months, man. But I was doing material. It was a great week. I got to do different material all week. Uh, I was very excited. And the people in Oklahoma City have been fantastic. Uh, there's some viewers here I ran into over the weekend that watched me uh, this weekend and I met. So you guys, thank you so much. I don't have a lot of news. I want to get right to our guest because uh, he has a he has another Zoom obligation shortly uh, after this one. So we're going to get him out here pretty quick. The only news is, uh, for some of you guys, I know this affects you. Um, the Carnival has officially canceled their cruises for November. So uh, I know that it, that it affects a couple of you guys. And um, it, it absolutely uh, affects me. So uh, it kind of sucks. So I, I can't say I'm surprised. But I was hoping that they would launch. I was hoping that they would uh, start uh, sailing. But it, that is not going to be the case. And now they're aiming for December, maybe January 1st. I don't really know how it's going to pan out. But uh 
for those of you that did have, uh, I know a couple of you had November cruises. Those are now gone. So, sorry. Also, all the Australian cruises the early part of next year are gone as well, January and February. If any of the guys were worrying, wondering about that. Uh, I guess that's about it. Let's say hello. Yeah, flannel shirt. Robin, thank you very much. Robin Greenberg is here. Larry's wife, Ray, is here. Uh, Larry said, yeah, no mask in OKC. It's pretty amazing, man. We went out to dinner last night, and uh, they just, there's, I guess there's no COVID here, I guess. I guess. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's not true. There's COVID here. There's COVID everywhere. Um, who else is here? Lori's here. Robin's here. Everybody's here. Okay. You guys are great. Guys, I can't thank you enough for tuning in. And with that, let's get right to our guest. Our guest is a good, uh, good friend of mine I've known for years. Uh, he's an actor, writer, comic. He was on uh, Mr. Show years ago with uh, uh, David Cross and Bob Odenkirk. Also, he is the, he's an acting teacher and instructor and the founder of of uh, the Yard Theater in L.A., uh, in Hollywood. Please give it up for my good friend. Here he comes. John Ennis. Here he is. Look, there he is. Yeah. He's got sound effects and everything. He whistles. Dude, look at you. You look very You look very Harvardish. Oh, do I really? Well, that's a good thing. Yeah, you look classy, man. This is, I wish I would have known. Right I moved into a sauna, Lenny. It's been going well. That, with the sweater. You, you gotta, you're you going to lose some weight that way, brother. Good for you. Smart move. <laughs> Indeed, too. Well, it's, it's, it's it's quarantine. You got to do something, brother. Or it's whatever. How are you? I'm good. I went seven months with the eating, and now I'm going to go seven months the other direction. See what happens. Okay, that's uh, that's healthy, right? That, yeah. the, that's that could be healthy. I don't know. Got to stretch it. You know, push the limits, man. P push the limits yeah. of your body, John. Push the limits of your body. See how far you can take. I wanted to see how far I could go before I just said, you know what? I can't walk around that good. Yeah, <laughs> I, I should do something about my knee. I should do something about it. this. My dog is like, you're slowing down. I can't. I always have a problem. Like, I don't know what kind of car you drive, but I drive a, 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 a Nissan Altima, and I do better. Uh -huh. with, this is a mark of age and fatness. Uh, I do better with, like, an SUV because you can kind of step out of it. But, like, a, a, a car like that, you got to pull yourself out, and it's, it's not good on my back or my shoulder. At 50, we start to reach for the things that might look a little more elegant. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have those things either. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm Fair trying. Enough. You're trying. Uh, so how you doing, buddy? Where are you at now? I know you live in L.A., but where are you at in L.A.? Where? I live in Encino. Oh, you're close. You're really close to where. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I used to live in a log cabin in Silmar, and with all the fires, I had to move. My dog couldn't breathe. Oh, geez. Yeah, right. Even you're still getting... There was a fire in Encino a couple days ago, I heard. Is that right? Yeah, there, that one wasn't bad, though. But even the smoke from the... You know, I feel bad for the people that are living right there. Um, but Ugh. it was... It, you know, it's a lot on an animal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's right. It's got to be bad on a dog, man. You know what I mean? He's running around. He doesn't know what the hell's going on. Exactly. He's just asking... Right. He's like, this is bullshit. Yeah. What happened? I can't... Yeah, he did feel sick. Yeah. <laughs> But he is my best friend and my roommate right now. Oh. Still, you know, I'm talking in paragraph form to my dog the way my sister always did, and I made fun of her. And now I'm like, listen, I'm going to be back, but after I go to the store, I'm going to I'm gonna finish up, and then I'll be, you know, like. You become that guy? That. So you give him a whole to-do yeah, list? I, become, <laughs> I know three sentences in, he's going like, you can just go. Snack? Yeah, he's like, snacks? 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 Yeah. Like, but, he, uh, I, but I bought him. The best dog bones that money can buy, and he's got twenty different kinds. And he'll just look at me and go like, "No, that's not the one I wanted. Why did you put that down?" You know? <laughs> You've officially reached reached roommate status with your pet. I love when people get I, to that I'm, point. I'm begging for his love now, begging. Yeah. <laughs> can you just forgive me for all this, dude? That's when you know a dog. That's when a dog knows he's got you. You know what I mean? Oh, that's he's got me so bad. He can. <laughs> He just barks at me, and he's basically saying, look, look, Tubby, put down the cheese curls. I need a walk. <laughs> All right. I love, I love when they get to a point they have an attitude. We were over, we were watching football a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Anna was there. My daughter Anna was there, who's a student at your at your, uh, at your your theater. She's a wonderful actor. Wonderful thank actor. You. Thank you. Yeah, she's. I'm very proud of her. She does an excellent – she loves you, man. She loves it. She loves the theater. She loves it. Um, very strong. Great range. Thank Seriously. you. Yeah, good. Yeah, she should uh, – she works hard, bro. She's uh, – She's really into it. I'm really, I'm really proud of her. But uh, she was at Rick's. We were hanging out. We we're getting ready to leave. It was that day I told you we were going. And uh, John was there with, uh, with Joey, with his dog Joey. And he's uh, throwing the ball. And I swear, Anna gets the ball. Anna gets the ball. And Joey's sitting there. And he throws it. 
And he looks at the ball and he just looks at her. He told you, he didn't go get the ball or anything. And she looks and goes, that's whoa, funny. what the hell was that? And I go, wow, that's a big F you from the dog. He's like, he's that's like, funny. My dog, you can hear the conversation. He's like, I remember that yeah, dog. I, I know. Are you guys talking about me? I heard my name. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, Pop, come here, buddy. Come here, buddy. My mail usually gets delivered about now. You know, it's six o'clock. Everyone else has got their mail. Right. I feel like the guy goes, "Oh, you know what? I should swing back and bring that guy his mail." <laughs> you're the guy on the, you're on the way home. You're the yeah, guy I know, you never, it's like everyone's got their mail. Oh, now my dog's barking. It's here. That's good. What's your dog's I name? Ordered off Facebook. That's half the size that said it was, and twice as much. You got you. You got what? Like telescope from Facebook. You know, I oh. just got these stupid things over the last seven months like oh that looks like that would be really good <laughs> you know, no it's not did you order it did you order, do, I I, ordered a couple of things. dude i keep ordering stuff online and uh i keep screwing up because you can't nothing comes out nothing comes out the way i got that stupid it's banana like chair monkeys. thing yeah what was that thing called when we were kids and it turned into like monkeys in the fish tank the sea monkeys you threw sea monkeys <laughs> Everything is sea monkeys now. Facebook just sells sea monkeys of all different, whatever you want it to be. Well, yeah, we'll tell you that's what it is then. And then you'll send us money. This is perfect. Well, and you're, if you're a kid, you look at it long enough and you believe you believe it. You go, look, they really are sea monkeys. They really are. I yeah. am a kid. This is my problem. <laughs> my imagination is way stronger than the product could ever be. It's like reading a book where you're like, whoa, and the movie's not that good. You're like, oh. <laughs> well, you're their perfect customer then. They love you if you're still yeah. a kid, the big fifty year old kid. That's the issue I big got. Um, sap. Yeah, that's I. I got the same thing. See, Anna is the one that's got her sh head together in my house. She's the one that she's always like, Dad, can you please can you calm down? She's she's got to keep. <laughs> you know what I mean, she's really. I'm telling you, man, she got her bank account down. I'm proud of her. I keep telling her. Oh, man. Well, my kids too. My kids are. I they, I just basically say, what's the plan? Yeah. And they tell me where we're going and what we're doing. Dude, I look at Ann all the time and go, what, what, what do we, yeah, what's, what's, what do you think we should yeah. do? What, what should I do here? Yeah, my daughter sent me the entire voting. Um, there's a woman named Allison who sends out a voting, uh, what do you call it? That basically tells you their take on all the different issues. So you can, after doing some research and some work, I then checked my work with this person. I was like, oh, well, actually, I'm voting for all the same things. But it's my daughter who's like, Dad, check this out. You know, she's always done that for me. Ever since, uh, before she could even vote, uh, she would be sending me, don't forget about this issue. Don't forget about this. You know, she's on every single issue. How uh, how old is your daughter? Um, my oldest daughter uh, is 29. Anna is just starting to get involved in that stuff to where she's really, she's deep. This is a rough year. You know, 2020 has just been a rough year. So it's, especially at their age, I can't even imagine trying to have um, all of these things that tell me I can't do, can't be, don't, you know, it's, it's very hard at 50 in our fifties. For me, it's easier to say, well, what can I still do? Right. right. You know, <laughs> not that hard for me because lots has been taken away over the years of things you can do and stuff you should no longer do. Right. Moving and on from those things, what's left to do? Right. You know, I end up with like a cup of lemon water going like, life is good. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Your, yeah. your, your bar's a lot lower now, though, too. It's like, it I takes. Know. The best fresh lemon. <laughs> Very good. My lemon. You know. It does. Be about, you know. But the things you want is less now, too, at 50. Like, when I was younger, 19, there was a lot of shit I wanted to do. And now, there's I get three things. If I get a good, like, a good <laughs> Wi-Fi and, like, a, you know, a, a, game, a, a game and, like, my, uh, some music. You know, just, like, three things. I'm good. A good sandwich. Exactly. Like a, I love, I like a sandwich. You know, just a little thing. I didn't know. I love a sandwich. I am so addicted to sandwiches. I would say more so than anything else, I kind of want a sandwich by Wednesday if I haven't had one. Yeah. You know, it's only two days into the week. Yeah, But yeah, I'm addicted to sandwiches. Oh, they're good, man. I like it. I like it. Um, so let's do. Uh, so, Mr. Show, were you were on for the whole run. How long was? Uh, how long were you on, Mr. Show? Uh, we did 33 it? episodes in four seasons, and I then want we came back, did a reboot. It was like a Mr. Show of shows kind of vibe. I saw that. I was going to show some of it, but I always had this issue with YouTube showing clips of stuff because then I get yelled at by YouTube. 
You know what I mean? Oh it's yeah, a cop- no it's a copyright issue. It's always like Rah. so. So I wasn't gonna able. Yeah. To- you know, they, they scream at me, um, dude. Cut, but you studied in Emerson. I saw you studied at Emerson. Um, when did you come to LA? When did you make the big move out to LA? In uh, 1993, uh, I got a call from David about a show called Today's Army. That was a show about behind the scenes of a comedy sketch group. And of course, we had been in comedy sketch groups together for years. And he and another great writer, Rob Cohen, wrote it. And it looked like it was going to happen. So he told me to move out to L.A. to be on this show. So we, I drove out with my wife. And at that time, I just had one child. I have three kids now. Um, but Jesse and, um, and her mom and I, we drove across country, got out here, and it was over. You know, before we landed in, on, on the shores of L.A., it was already <laughs> cool. done. So, so it was the perfect, you know, welcome to L.A. That's, yeah, that's not going to happen. Yeah, that's the great introduction to the whole show business vibe. Like, so how's the show look? Nah, it's dead. That's a dead deal. The whole way across. Like, I'm going to be on a show. Life is easy. Gas is free. You know, this was like an amazing trip. And then we get this like, thunk. And all of a sudden, I'm working at the Daily Grill in Studio City going, I'm so sorry. I forgot your blue cheese dressing. I'll be right back with that. You know, like, ah! And I've got some guy like half my age telling me, like, you have to remember every single um you know, item in the chopped salad. Now recite them. You're not ready to wait tables. You know, it was like all this weird energy. I'd been running restaurants my whole life. And suddenly I'm in LA and I'm back to restaurants. I hadn't worked in them in a long time. Yeah. I have you all. I'm back. I'm back delivering food now during this COVID thing. So this is the fourth time in my life I'm delivering food. And the third time we're going, we got to do stuff. Dude, you got to have money coming in. You got to have money coming in always. You got to do stuff. I hear you, bro. I hear you. Absolutely. Uh, now, let me. Well, you, you, if you studied, art. you studied Emerson. Uh, did you now? Did you have an improv theater out there, or did you just do improv and sketch stuff at Emerson? Uh, so we were at Emerson, and we were in a comedy group called This Is Pathetic, and okay. uh, there was like <laughs> fourteen of us or sixteen of us or whatever. Um, and you know, it was the best. It was like being the Beatles on a college campus. Our shows were sold out. And, we also there was another great comedy group also on campus called Comedy Workshop, so there was a healthy back and forth of like we would go to their shows, they would go to our shows. But I mean, they were packed. It was like the thing to do at school. Right. Did not quite get that energy after school. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Where you're like, what happened? There was every show was thrown out. Uh, but uh, but I we ended up I started a place called the Flurby Human Den in uh, Boston so that we could begin to do underground shows. And I pulled in David Frost and Carrie Prusa and some of my other favorite humans. And then we did auditions and had some great people show up like David Waterman and other people show up from auditions. And then we built this sketch group and I had a loft and it was 6,800 square feet and we would have keg beer on on an elevator and when the cops came, the elevator would just go down a floor and I'd lock it off. And we'd say, that's it. The beer's done. It's over. And then as soon as the cops left, I'd just raise it back up again and start serving beer again. <laughs> Clever. All right. I like it. Yeah. Um, that's uh, – I'm sorry, dude. It's got a thing here. Um, dude, that's great. Um, I did – well, I studied at I.O. in Chicago. So now when you, came, when you came here with Dave, did you guys do any theater stuff in L.A.? Or um, did you go right – I mean, when was Mr. Show? When did that kick off? So Dave, Dave had a show, uh, the Ben Stiller show, and oh, right, yeah. he and Bob. That's how they got to know each other, and they were writers on that show. And was that when that was over, they started doing stuff out there in the world. Uh, a show called Three Goofballs with myself, and Jeremy Kramer, and Brian Posehn, and Karen Kilgariff, and Molly Shannon, and uh, a whole bunch of different people. And um, and we did that show, like, going around to the comedy clubs. So we did that a bunch of different times, and then we did it at Aspen. And once we did it at Aspen, people like Molly Shannon had gone on to SNL, but we did it, and uh, the Tenacious D was a part of the show at that point. And right. so they were with Aspen as well. And then we lost that on those guys because Jack got a big feature. Um, but, you know, that's how we ended up getting the show, was we did a sketch show for a year right? called Three Three goofballs, even though there was like seven people in it. <laughs> I like that even matter it doesn't connect. Three goofballs or seven yeah. people. That's perfect. Yeah. That was that good? It was perfect. Um, oh, uh oh. Hold on. First technical issue of the day. Oh, dude. 
Yeah, there we go. Okay, you're back. I lost you for a second. All right. Um, uh, well, dude, that's the best. All right, and I know I was looking at your, your your IMDb. You got a great body of work. I know there's a bunch of stuff that you worked on, but I really wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, especially the yard, because I know a bunch of people that study over there besides uh, my daughter, Anna. So um, why don't you explain to me a little bit what's going on over there at the yard, and how's that going, by the way, viral-wise? I know that that's, you know, how's, how's that adaptation like, going? Like you. Like you, Lenny, I didn't wait. You know, the day that they told us we couldn't come back into the theater, I was up that night on on Zoom, and, uh, and one of the plays that we're doing in repertory, we have three plays in repertory, one from the past, one from the present, one from the future. And I've been working on these three plays for a long time with different people. So I know the plays inside and out. And when an actor comes into the group, they're asked to play every part in every play. What happened when we went to Zoom was only one of the plays – actually works in this world of Zoom. It can actually take place in Zoom. So every character is in Zoom. So we don't have to pretend that we're all in one place. So I moved that, which was our biggest of the three productions, from uh, the back burner, which would have been performed after Book of Liz by Amy David Sedaris. We moved Comic Potential by Alan Akeborn to the front burner, and we've been rehearsing that now literally ever since we went into quarantine. So okay. that shows up now, and we've got – Every actor plays every role in the play, whether right. they're a male or a female. So uh, that's now basically I'm picking names out of a hat and doing the production every week with a different cast. But anybody can get involved because, as I say, we do this on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays, and we have uh, um, rehearsals. But part of this program is I went to Harvard after Emerson and I got to watch the American Repertory Theater actors do their thing, like their process. We weren't allowed to talk to them or ask them questions, but we were able to watch what they did as an actor, what their process was. And years later, I taught at Lee Strasberg for 10 years, and I, I realized that the one thing actors didn't have was access to older actors or even just more experienced actors. And so it's not even as much about age as it is about who's got time on set, who's got time doing this because, you know, we learn over time that when we meet somebody that has something we want, we actually, if we listen, we can actually help ourselves get those things. Right. So uh, to having someone on stage who knows the play inside and out, there's this actor, Dave Hawthorne, who was uh, Billy Crystal. Oh, you know, Dave. Yeah. 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 yeah that's Dave another Hawthorne. guy. Anna loves Dave. Anna mentions Dave all the time. She goes, do you know Dave Hawthorne? He's so strong and he's yeah. known these plays the whole time we've been doing them. So in every play, actors get to get on stage with Dave and he just looks them in the eye and knows all the lines. So they're going like this at first and then like your daughter, right. they don't want to do that anymore. They want to come in off book and be able to do the work and play the game. As I, I like to say, like, put on your new tennis outfit, restring your racket, get new sneakers and come and play. Right, right. Because in the beginning, you're just hitting the ball against the wall. But I'm not giving anybody notes at the beginning because as an actor – it's, it's my feeling that we need a process that allows us to say word or line and have those words fed to us without any cadence or anything. Just like, don't tell me how to say it, but what are the words? Right. And then our brain can start to realize just how strong we are at memorization and start to do the work. And then how, many, how, many, how much time when I'm not in rehearsal do I spend as an actor doing this thing I want to do so much? Because I watch the ones who spend a lot of time doing it, and they're the ones getting the work. And I coach over 70 working actors in TV and film. Every day on Zoom, I'm working with somebody in New York, Chicago, Boston, L.A., Portland, San Fran, like every day now. So for me, the viral world has actually blown up my theater to where I can help people in other locations because this Zoom thing isn't so foreign to them anymore. Right. And so, so people are passing the word on, oh, I work with John on Zoom all the time, you know, and now that world is growing. But I used to have, you know, three or four actors a day come to meet me at the theater. And then some of the actors I've been coaching for over a decade, I still go to their homes or their uh, apartments or whatever. So, you know, but I never stopped doing it. In some ways, as much as I don't have to drive now, I'm on the Zoom working on the theater stuff more than I ever have been. And we just did a benefit. My partner at the theater's name is Frank Fairfield, a really well-known musician in L.A., um, and we just put up our first benefit. But now we're going to be doing one of those every month. And so if anybody wants to train as an actor, if they have a show they're trying to put up, uh, you know, we've got uh, – we're, we're still putting up live shows, and then we're just putting them so that people can watch the content at the yard. Okay. This is really interesting. All right, that's that's amazing. So um – 
so yeah, so you're almost technically you're working more. It seems like you're working more now than you were before. The Zoom thing just opened up a whole different world to you. You know what I mean? It's At least like, in the theater. I mean, yeah. I'm not getting kind of roles. You know, I was on that show Dead to Me last year, and I was on a show called Bruce Brothers on Netflix, and it felt like every week I was getting something else. Right. And that all slowed way down. But right. then it started, things started picking up again. I got a couple gigs this past month working as an actor again. But, you know, you get there, and you're the only one on set. And the other actor's going to be there the next day, and they're going to turn around and shoot their stuff. So it's a little different, you yeah. know. Uh, but to train as an actor in Zoom is a much different task than, than training as an actor on stage. For one, all my actors right now that are working on the Zoom play can have the script right here. Right. So they can, they can glance up at the line and, and know their next line by just glancing. On stage, you can't get away with that. Right, right. So for some people, their minds actually do a better job processing the task of memorization on Zoom because they can cheat. Right. Like you and I cheated at math, Lenny. Yeah, of course, so, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that little glance of, of Mr. Teitelbaum's paper, who I know is getting an A. Right. You know, eventually by seventh or eighth grade, we had it down to this, like, what would the root of... Yeah, you know, I was like, a big, you know, I was a big stretcher. I was a big. I'm exhausted. Uh, okay, I guess that's nine square I know five. I'm gonna get a better answer from that than I am from me trying to do this. Um, <laughs> so you know, I do think for some actors, they go like, "Oh, I can pull this off," and now they've put in the work. And there's one, uh, there's an actor named Milas um, who's from Brazil. And she's an incredible actor. Her main thing has just been saying the words correctly, enunciation and diction. Another actor might have an issue with physicalizing the words, letting it just like pour out of them. Right. So repetition, repetition, repetition. You know, what do we do when we want to memorize something? And because I've been doing this for so long, I get to learn from every single person I get and I work with because whatever their task is, we're going at that together. We're uncovering the clues of what the scene means or the play means or the film or the show. Right. And then, you know, it, it makes me, um, as an artist, I get excited. You know, yeah. art gets me excited. Without it, I'm screwed. So when this happened, I'm like, well, what am I going to do? I've done six different benefits to raise money for things, and it's been a blast. I did one with uh, that same Bob... Rob Cohen and Dave Cross also wrote a, a film with Ben Stiller called um, Towering Disaster. And it was written back in the 80s. It was like a parody of all those disaster films. Oh, well, they right. Dusted that, they dusted that thing off and then brought it out and raised like 100 grand for charity. Great. And I did one for Malcolm in the Middle where they raised $240,000 for charity uh, for veterans. And then I did one for uh, kids in Arizona with the Arizona Lottery. But these are all things on Zoom where, for the first time, like I say, people are willing to go into Zoom and watch a benefit and pay right. money. Right. When has that ever happened, Lenny? As you know, this is the beginning of something, not the end. Right, right, exactly. So yeah. the, world, the, world we were, the world we were in still exists. It's just slowed way down, and this world has sped way up. I'd right. rather run with faster runners and learn how to be that than sit there waiting and complaining, why don't I get to do what I used to do? No, nah, you're you know, just you're 100 percent right. It's we've been throwing a curveball, and you have two choices: you sit around and complain and wait for things to go back, or you go, "Okay, how do I adapt? How do I how do yeah. I move forward?" You know, you got to keep we moving, man. Theater. We shot some bits in the theater and like a dance number and stuff to put in the benefit. And one thing I learned was, "Wow, do I look fat?" <laughs> I because when I watched it, I'm like. What is? What am I holding? Oh, I'm not holding. Oh, anything. you're not holding anything. Oh my god, I know. I know what I'm <laughs> holding. That's I'm just a, me. I'm just I, holding me. It looks like I'm holding know? a couple of pizzas and a six pack there. Yeah, what that getting is. on stage was like a buzz that I haven't had. And, and even though I'm performing on Zoom and I'm doing stuff, being in the theater that I built with this, with this you know, these, all these other great artists, and you know, it's been a real home for me. And being in there and performing on the stage, even with an empty house, was such a buzz. It was yeah. so much. Like, you can't lose this place, man. We need spots like this for people to come back to where they have memories. As everything's getting shut down and closed down, we're just tripling our efforts and trying to raise money so that we can still give. You know, I have a children's program where it's cheaper than a babysitter. Yeah, it's basically less than ten dollars an hour to have your kid at the yard theater for their for their class because, you know, growing up, that's what saved my life was being able to go into the theater 
at nine years old, I played Pinocchio in Boston Children's Theater. Uh, it was called Stage Mobile. The sides of a truck fold down, and all the costumes and props and everything are in that truck. And when it folds down, they put car jacks underneath it. It becomes the stage. And then we do a play, and a different, um, you know, a thousand kids are watching us in Bill Ricca. Uh, one day and the next day we're, we're, we're in Swampskin. That's, that's a modern day version of the old uh, medicine man traveling in the old west where they would just put up a show or a carnival on the side of the road. Like, hey, and the jugglers would come out and you know what I mean? That's a pop up show. Yeah. Yeah. We did Pinocchio and the Three Little Pigs my first summer on stage mobile. And I was Pinocchio yeah. and one of the Three Little Pigs. So, you know, nowadays, if you got those two roles, you'd be like, ah. Eh. But at the time, it was like, holy shit, I'm Pinocchio, I'm one of the three little pigs. So it's going to be a heck of a summer. It really, it's going to, wow. And all the girls were two, three years older than me, but nobody cared. And that was the first time that had ever happened, where suddenly I'm 11, but a girl who's 13 and liking me. Yeah. Like in school, the divisions were such that that was no, never going to sure. happen. Oh, that was never going to happen, yeah. So I fell in love with theater forever. I was just like, there's nothing better than being away from my house, sleeping under the stars with girls, and then <laughs> performing together. Like, this is the best life. And so everyone that tried to talk me into math or science or anything that wasn't going to help me be an actor in my own view, I was like, you don't understand. I'm nine. I'm going to be an actor. I don't need your math. <laughs> I don't need your brain stuff. Get out of here. That's not going to happen. It's ridiculous. Exactly. You keep all that book learning. You and you and your your book learning. <laughs> That's the best. Your readings for squares. <laughs> exactly. Now, exactly. if you don't mind, I'm going to put on my nose and go play Pinocchio. Yes. All right. Exactly. Dude, I love that. I taught um, early on uh, at one of Anna's schools. I taught comedy and improv to kids, and I was a huge believer in. I love. I love working with kids and I love teaching kids and I love working with them on an acting level. I think it's the, it's the greatest, uh, it was the most stressful thing I did because they were, they were little kids at some point and it's chaos, but there's nothing more rewarding. And the confidence you put into a kid, I know what it's like for me as an adult to do something well in front of a crowd and they laugh. So for a seven year old kid to do it, the power behind that is unbelievable. So I was, I was a huge believer in it. It's amazing. There was a little one kid we taught. One kid I taught. I let him the comedy class. I let him pick whatever they wanted to do, and at the end of it, I would fashion a show around whatever they brought to the table. And one kid wanted to do stand up. I go, oh man, I don't know if he can do. I don't know. And he, but he, and then, <laughs> I, but I'm like, yeah, let's give it a shot. Let's do it. And I used to do. I used to rent a theater to do a, a show for the parents that I completely took a bath on every time and like no one turned out except parents. So it was, and they got, they got part of the deal was when they pay for the class, they got the free class. They got the free tickets to the show. So I wasn't selling any tickets, but then we did the auditorium two years in a row. We did the uh, 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 assembly for the whole school. And this little kid, right. Luke, Lucas Anderson goes out and I will never, this is the greatest moment maybe in my entire professional life, man. He goes out and does stand up in front of the whole class uh, and crushes. And I mean, nice. crushes. And he was always kind of, you know, he's always a jumpy and, you know, and, but we, after that, I, I remember him, I remember the look on his face walking toward me when I took him off. And I put up my hand to high five him and he almost ripped my hand off. And I went out and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, Lucas Anderson. And the place erupts into laughter. But man, I, that kid, it was like his feet weren't touching the ground. That's a huge thing. That's it. It's least you a, say to a kid, hey, look, I have a key here. And it unlocks who you are. Yeah, yeah, Why yeah, yeah. Just, and some kids are like, yeah, I want nothing to do with that. You're old and I don't care for it or whatever. Like, okay. But then there's right. kids that go, wait, what? A key? Yeah. And they take it and they go, me? I could be good at something? You yeah. have approval for me? And, you know, none of us got what we wanted as kids. No, Nobody no, no. got Nobody all that. Right. Everyone's sister was more loved or everyone's brother was more loved. Everyone has an issue. We've all got issues. So... In performance, we get to take back what we didn't have right. and give back. You know, like to me, I learned a while back that the feeling of why aren't I getting loved the way I want to from the people around me is a hopeless. And, you know, to try to hope for that is ridiculous. Yeah. But if I just give love, I feel love. Yep. So yep. by just giving love, I'm in love with the life that I have, with the world around me. Like, it sounds so silly, but it's real. Yeah. That like, oh, I am in love with art. I'm in love with the people that do art. I'm lo I'm in love with the fact that we have 
the ability to get out of our heads and all with all this stuff going on in the world and focus on something that like, okay, what can we say now? You know, there's all these major issues have come up in the world just in the last year yeah. that need to be focused on by all of us. Right. What are we going to say about it? My, my favorite thing has been to be Archie Bunker, the whole, you know, how can I show people how not to behave? Right, right. You know, <laughs> that's my favorite thing about art. I love being the asshole who throws themselves under the bus. Right. So, so I'm doing a bit where I'm getting coached about how to deal with race. Right. But the whole time I'm, I'm a complete tool. Right. You you're know, just, you're, br- you're being abrasive against it. And it's, and it's I'm a- not even racist. I'm not even a guy who's racist. It's not of it's not uh, angry racism. It's institutionalized racism. Yeah, right. Taught it, throughout as you grow, you know, the, 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 we, all, we all grew up with the stuff that we grew up with, but we're basically the same. We all grew up with it. Yeah. Massachusetts, we didn't have any Mexican restaurants. Yeah. There was no, there was no Japanese food. There was none of these things when I was growing up. We didn't have that kind of culture around us. So those things were foreign. So you'd hear people say things just like Archie Bunker about anything that's not who they are was threatening to them. Right. That like we're gonna come and take, you know, what we have. The same yeah, time. Take my stuff. Yeah. Which yeah, is a ridiculous it's, it's, right. Right. It's a fear based like system where they just like let's scare people um uh, away from caring about one another. But in and, art and what, we don't what, do that. And what also what doesn't make it e- that same type of level, I'm also a pink believer in I don't I don't get very political in the show, but politicians use that fear to push us left or right or different directions and try to control us as a mass. So and divide, right? Divide, divide completely. It's all dividing, right? right. One. Yeah. So the minute they can divide us, now they've got only half as much to deal with. Yep. Yep. And then they can pit us against each other, and they go, "Well, let them fight for a while, yeah. and then we'll come back and check on them in six months." You know, it's that type of thing. Yeah. My my thing, just the same with like working with kids as you have done. You know, you work with kids for a long time. And then for me, I ended up working with those same kids because they became adults. Yeah, that's kind of so, cool. Uh, yeah. It's so cool that I worked with a kid when he was eight or nine years old. And now I'm working with him at 26. Yeah. You know, because I'm still doing the same thing I was doing then. I'm still loving working with kids. I actually walked into Lee Strasberg. My kids were going to uh, school there. And the woman said, you know, John, our teacher got appendicitis. I know you're an actor. Is there any way you would step in and teach today? And I was like, I've got a tennis match, you know. <laughs> and she's like, well, how much do you pay for the courts? And I'm like, oh, nothing. <laughs> nothing. I don't have you anything. sub in today, just today? Could you sub in? And I subbed in. And like you, I came out of that class, and I was the kid ripping her hand off. Yeah, I was the high five. Yeah, yeah, you're excited. Like, you're like, that was the best day ever. <laughs> don't give this class to anyone else. Yeah. All I could think about was, oh, my God, if I can get good at this, by the time my daughters are of the age where I could help them artistically, I'll have worked at teaching Yeah. the whole time. I have a decade to work on it. So right. now it's two decades later. And, and my daughter, Jesse has her own show on uh, Mythic Quest on uh, Apple TV. Uh, my daughter, Connie, and I are doing art together. She helps run the theater and. When we, when we had no money last year. She's the one who like forked up four grand to pay our rent. Wow! Um, so you know it's a family affair for sure with the theater. Dude, that's um, got to be really cool to have both daughters involved on that level with what you're doing. You know what I mean? That's got. Well, be you know, really Lenny, cool. you know, my football, baseball, hockey, all the stuff I grew up loving. If my kids scored a goal in one of those, I'd be like, "Great job!" But if they said three lines in a play. I would talk about it for two years until yeah. the next play. <laughs> so it's my it's my football touchdown that was like, you guys, we're doing this. You know, yeah, I right. put this thing in a way I didn't mean to. You know, I, I didn't mean to infect them with this thing that we love so much. But my daughter, Jessie, is so much more educated than I've ever been that she took it to this other place and she does the work. And I get to coach her on every single script she works on, every audition, everything she books. I just uh, read lines with her, um, uh, what, Saturday? I'm reading lines with her again tonight, later. You know, it's a blast working with my own daughter on her yeah. job and tuning in with her, and now we're on Zoom. But, like, going over, like, finding the clues, all that stuff, it's like what we've been doing together since she was three. Right. You know? So, so that part is, you know, it's pretty magical. And, and I, I, again, I am not... Uh, unaware that there are people struggling right now. I'm, I'm just such an optimist 
that I keep thinking about the clean water and the clean air and all the puppies and kittens that got adopted. And I'm not even joking. I, I keep thinking about 800, car, 800 million cars off the street, 80 million just in our state, you know. Yeah. But the world changed because of it. So something had to change in order, you know, we weren't listening. Right, right. So I don't know. Somehow it feels to me like, yeah, this sucks. And I really wish we had had better leadership to handle it. But maybe this is a world where we all say we all have the same respiratory system. You know, you know, from being in Oklahoma and performing, you know, in Oklahoma that like those people need you. Lenny, they need they need to see live comedy. They need to be around real artists like yourself who've been yeah. doing this. Well, they did. I know. think well, there's been a thing. The government just started pushing. Uh, I don't know if you've been seeing those memes out lately on the internet and social media and stuff. And it's basically it's uh it's always it's someone in the arts. It's a dancer or a singer or a musician or somebody, and it says their next career might be in electronics or whatever. They just don't know yet. So they're oh, already, wow. they're trying to train artists are to think well maybe it's time to go and, and get some other type of real job to which you know I've, obviously I disagree with that also like you said well, you and i realize we don't have that ability yeah this is all i can do that's the other thing is i don't have I don't, my options are limited man this is it i'm 55 this is, i hope you know me yeah i yeah <laughs> Dude, also, I'm also almost past the age of physical labor. You know what I mean? Like, I could do physical oh, yeah. labor, but it almost. hurts really bad. You know? It's like, no, I had a garage from, from uh, years ago that I just emptied and finally moved to the house I live in now. And I'm just moving stuff around today. Finally, like, getting to it. I'm going to do this. My hip oh, is dude. killing me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I know, I'm I, like, I know. what? I'm not that old. I'm in, I'm in pretty good shape. What the hell? But yeah, no, these the the, the, tre the what you just said. If we had to shovel snow, Lenny, no, we did, no, 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 no. Well, done. we just We're we done. moved we moved about three weeks ago. The girls and I moved across the street because both daughters live with me now, and now, oh, right. and we, yeah, yeah. But no, we, I need a bigger yeah, place. Know, so. What's your other daughter's name? Lily. 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 Right. Right. Cool. Yeah, and dude, she might be coming your way soon too, man. Because she's. Uh, I would be awesome. Yeah, she's she's really she. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you this. When she was in the comedy class, she could. When I work the shifts, I bring the kids. She comes on stage, and does improv with me when I'm when I'm doing the shows. That kid can improv with adults. I've had her in a situation when she was seven, improvising with with a bunch of adults, and she just keeps. I mean, she's quick, quick timing. Both my kids are very. My ex also yeah, is in the. Anna's fearless. Anna yeah. has presence. There's actors on on stage who are all in their fifties and sixties, and she's got this presence where it's like she just belongs there with them. Yeah. That's good though. I think I, I, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna toot my own horn a little bit there for that because I always try to set that precedent in their mind when they worked when they were on stage. I made them think they belonged on. St you're there. You're in the moment. My big thing is the moment. If you're on stage, all that matters is being present in that moment and listening to the people around you. Doesn't matter who's been acting longer, who you know, who's taller, who's yeah. older. None of that crap. You know what I mean? So yeah, we get to, we get to participate as yeah. artists with each other. Yeah, yeah, but you know, dude, when, getting back to what you said earlier about the Oklahoma City thing, I don't understand why they haven't. Your arts is needed more now than any time it ever has been. You know, I mean, I, I think the whether it's stand up comedy, it's different. And like you said, different things are being recreated. There's Zoom shows. There's all kinds of Zoom readings. And there's different formats that are being uh, created streaming wise. I don't understand. I don't know. I, it just seems like the government, a lot of people are like, well, the artists, they're listed as one of the most non-essential jobs ever. Like, it's in the top three. Like, artist is one of them. Remember they, Bill Hicks? Yes, of course. So Bill Hicks calls Barry Crimmins in the middle of the night. It's like 2 a.m. He says, Barry, I'm in Oklahoma because you told me I needed to do these shows across the country. And I just did a show. And what the hell did you send me here for, man? What the hell am I doing in Oklahoma? Why did you tell me this was so important? He said, those are beautiful people, man. Who needs them more than, who needs you more than they do? And he just fell silent and realized, oh, right. I do have a job yeah. to bring joy, not just where it's easy for me to bring joy. Yeah. But how do I crack the safe that is, in this case, Oklahoma, a beautiful right. place filled with beautiful people, but, you know, they don't necessarily have a lot of, you know, they don't have the Grand Central of art going on there. Right. 
No, no, you're absolutely right. And they're hard. Like, and they're also, I like, they're they're hardworking blue collar people. You know, they just, just like wanna, that. Well, they want to go. Yeah, they're exactly like me. They're where I come, a South Side Chicago guy. It's the same vibe. And they go out. They work all week. Yeah. I look at the same. Yeah, I was coming you from Boston. I'm like, what are you getting at? Yeah. <laughs> he, he uh, the same thing on the cruises is the same thing, man. Um, when people show up on cruises, it's not all a bunch of people that are rich who want to be on cruises. Some people save all year long for that vacation, and they're from Oklahoma. I, I went on one of those cruises. I performed yeah. on one. I was amazed. I loved. I loved it. I thought it was incredible, and I loved the the camaraderie of the crew and the and the performers and stuff. It was pretty magical. Yeah. But I can't imagine what that's like to be at sea for a year. You know, yeah. that's to me impressive. That yeah, somebody, I never you know, did. I I couldn't do that either. I got to be honest with you. We would do a week or two at a time, and I don't know what the future holds for cruise ships, but I knew people that would do nine month contracts, and that was just like yeah, Julie Bard. You know, Julie. Yeah. Yeah, I love her. She's a yeah. magnificent performer, wonderful friend. Um, that's who brought me out and let me do a show with her. Um, but yeah, she was out there nine months out of the year. That's brutal. Every that's year. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah. some and you usually take three months off. That's the way a lot of the crews does it. They'll do nine months, take two or three months off. Every once in a while, catch somebody go back to back. It's a lot on a. Sh- I, if I'm on the same ship more than three weeks, I get a little. I get you know. I get a little. Yeah, weird. I was starting to get a little. Yeah, I was sober, and as you know, the crew just gets hammered right at six p.m. Yeah, yeah, all the it's, way till midnight. Well, the, and the liquor's cheap; it's like a buck for a drink. And yeah. you know, I mean, there's nothing. nothing to do on the. There's absolutely nothing to do on the ship but drink. I and had like to a, literally force myself to go back and read in my room. <laughs> you lock yourself in there. I'm not coming out. I had to. Yeah. Everyone was so hammered, and by being sober, it was like this is not. This is not good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's there's nothing worse than being around a bunch of drunk people when you're not drinking. You know, that's the yeah, worst. On the ship. Yeah. <laughs> on the ship. Yeah. You know, right. I would get on the, I wasn't smoking pot either, and I would get onto these islands in like St. Croix and, you know, all these amazing places in the Caribbean. And the first one we got off, this guy goes, Hey, man, I have what you need, man. Big dreads and colorful outfit and everything. And I was like, <laughs> Uh,. No, yeah. uh, thank you, but I, I recognize you, God. Good try with the outfit. <laughs> I love, they're always trying to sell crap off those. I, I always laugh. They have a scam they run in NASA. I don't know if they still do it, but uh, it's one bag of pot. It's one bag of pot. They have one bag of pot. Somebody sells it to you. When you get on the ship, security searches you, finds the pot, charges you, finds you, bribes you, basically. and says, you know, well, if you want to get back on the ship, it's going to cost you. And you, they pay the guy. They confiscate the pot, give it back to the guy, sells it to another guy, and then this goes on all day long. That's a fucking movie, oh, dude. That is, yeah. That's a, if you know, talking about making I a buck. That. That's crazy. I love that as an idea, as a film. Like all we need is to be the ship doesn't even have to be at sea. Yeah. All we yeah. do is shoot in the parking lot. Yeah. That is so funny to me that the same bag of herb gets like seven people busted. Yeah, I don't even know if it was like, real herb. You know what I mean? It could have been anything at that point. It's, but they're just they're I, bribing I, I, these guys. Really that, but there's been times in my life where I've given the money and now I'm looking at like a piece of tinfoil in my hand. Hey! Yeah, I've done that too. I remember, well, I remember the old days when you had to buy a pot in an alley. Remember, or you yeah, have to like go. Do you have to, you have to go. Or to, look, we're we're going to meet my guy and you stand around for like two hours. Where's he at? You know, remember, you yeah, know. What's going on? Yeah, that's, he'll or be like here. He'll be here. I gave somebody money in Barbados, and they ran into the woods, and I was like, wow, he really wants to help me. He's not coming back. (laughs) (laughs) There was one. It was in Denver. Denver had a scam. This was a great setup in Denver when I bought. Some guy would come up and buy. Some guy would come up, and and he'd go, what do you need? I go, well, I just want to need. I want whatever. And he goes, okay, fine. He walks away, and a guy goes buying a bike. And you hand the guy on the bike the money, and the guy drives away on the bike. And he gives it to another guy. The guy does another lap on the bike and then picks up the pot from another guy and then brings you the pot. So there's four different people involved in this thing so that if the cops ever show up, they go their separate ways and nobody knows what's going on. And all the pots right. hit that in was, the tree. They, that's so, awesome. The dude, money and the pot can never be in the same place yeah, at the same time. Right, right. And I love the fact, I'm like, I wonder how many times that it went wrong before they figured this system out. Yeah. <laughs> and they go, this weed, I got it now. They're never going to catch us. Because then the pot's yeah. the pot's actually in a tree, because they got yeah, the guy goes to get the pot, so so no one has the pot. So if the Jeff cops Shaheen, show, 
take a uh, remember those Secrets box? Secrets was yeah, like yeah, a, the little metal metal yeah, yeah. box. So he would sell joints out of that. There was a church at the end of the parking lot near our school, and he would sell joints out of the Secrets box. But if you were like said to him in first period, "Hey man, I I want to buy a joint," he'd say, "All right, give me the money, and I'll tell you where it is." And you're like, "What?" And then he he would have taped it to a yeah. tree or taped it to a thing and you like, go out and there'd be eight joints in there and you're just taking one and you're taping it back to the tree. Oh, seriously? Oh, that's the yeah. best. That's great. It was really yeah. funny. But same thing where it was like, yeah. And, you know, I think I missed the nefarious part of all that stuff more than anything. Just the, uh, the fun of having it be illegal when we were kids. Yeah. It was like, you know, they're missing out on a lot of fun, not getting busted now. Well, I used to, uh, I used to sell. I used to sell. Uh, I used to sell everything when I was younger. I was like nineteen, twenty, and I got pulled over by the cops once, and they started going through my car. And I just picked up uh, about four pounds of pot that was in the back. Oh, no. It was in the trunk of my car. And uh, dude, I had. I mean, I had that, and then I had like whatever. What the hell? I had an eight ball in the glove box. I mean, it was not. It was a. It was a party night, and I just got the pot and basically it was, broke. A, party it was night. a big party night. So the cops pull over, and I'm in a sm- relative a town. Every cop knows me in town, and they come up and they're like, "What are you doing?" I go, oh, "I'm, you know, I'm going to pick up Gerber, which is another friend of mine." So they go to search my car, uh, and they see beer in the back seat because I'm an idiot. And they go, "Is that is that beer? It was a half a case of Old Milwaukee." He goes, "Is that beer?" I go, "Yeah, that's yeah." And then they get a call, and he goes, uh, "And they ha- it's like a massive call." He goes, "He looks at me, and goes, this is your luckiest day of your life,'" and he oh. leaves. You have no idea. Dude, I go. You sir. have no idea how lucky this day was, because <laughs> I would, I would probably, I would have been in jail for a long time. For I mean, I had a lot, and it was right before uh, I was getting ready to, because I was selling pot to save money to move to California. So yeah, this was that was so that was the last one. I go. This is it. We got to sell this, and I need to get the hell out of here. That's a sign for That's me so to move out here. Yeah. So I barely, I barely. You made ever it. have that moment in Chicago where you're like, do I stay and become bigger at this? No, I should go do my career. Yeah, I, I yeah, I did. There, like, there's a little part of go. This this system is working really good, actually. It doesn't suck. Yeah, it doesn't suck. But I, I always knew. I always knew that I was, there's just a matter of time. And I had friends that got yeah, arrested. My dad, and, me, my dad said to me, "If you sell pot, that's all people will ever think of you as what you do." Yeah, and true. I was like, "Oh, that hurts. Why did you have to say that?" <laughs> you gotta put it that way. <sighs> yeah, all right. Well, you gotta be- but he had a phone call from my friend Frank. He called, Frank called and was like, John, bring me three quarters and an eighth to the party. And he doesn't realize he's leaving that on my father's answering machine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm staying at my dad's house. But it's <laughs> my message on his outgoing machine. My dad was like, John, you make a message. Because my dad would call in to uh, leave you a message when phone, when phone machines first came out. And he'd go, dear son. There's a great show on PBS, and uh, you should tune in Sunday at seven. Love, Dad. <laughs> that would be a no, it like a he would do love, Dad. That's the best. Like a letter. Yeah. Would, each one would sound like a letter. A letter. <laughs> that's good. Well, at least you stuck with the etiquette. That's good. Yeah. All right, we got to go, man. I know you got to get out of here at six fifty-five. But real quick, is there that anything you want to? What's uh, what do you want to plug? What do you want to do before you get out of here? You want to talk about the yard? Your last benefit was on September twenty-fifth. Is that correct? Yeah, you- everyone just check out, check out the yard. It's theyardtheater.com, and we've got lots of benefits and shows up. There's also incredible music shows every Monday night from all over the world. Frank Fairfield is an incredible musician, and all his music is from like before nineteen thirty. But he's been all over the world. So these people that are coming in, we have a cymbalum band from Romania. And we've got, I mean, uh, um, mariachi, female mariachi band. uh, They're up for Grammys. Like, we've just been having an incredible year before this happened with getting shows up. So please, we're going to keep doing all this stuff online. So please check us out and come be a part of us. We want you as an artist there. I'm serious. You're welcome to call me at 213-453-7429. There's no one I don't want to help. All right. Thank you. Cool. I'll put all that stuff also in the bio afterwards, in the description of the video. All that information will be there so they can find the yard, they can find your inf- information, and they can uh, touch base with you. Cool? Fantastic. John, thank you, man. Good to see you. I'll see all you right, when, brother, I, love you, when, man. See you when I get back to soon. town. Yeah, take care of yourself. All right, guys. Everybody safe. say goodbye to John. Say goodbye to John and Ennis right there, folks. There he goes. All right. That's my friend John right there, folks. What do you think of that, my friend John? That was a good show. That was good. This is my first one on the road. I'm 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 feeling pretty good about this actually. Uh, it's a little it's a little different setup. It's weird. I'm traveling with stuff. Um, let me uh, comment really quick here. Uh, Gar, you said something. Yeah, you were actually with me on one of those uh, trips when I was delivering pizzas in uh, Mike Garcia. 
was was there. Uh, uh, I looked road kid for. I thought you might be broke up. No, I took no. I got the light. Hell no, man, Larry. Yeah, I brought the whole setup. It looks good. It looks the lighting's good. Everything's good tonight. I'm very happy. I think the show came out uh, came out well. I'm very and you guys were here again. Thank you so much for supporting the show. I can't uh, I can't thank you enough as always. Um, you guys know where to go if you want to support the show financially. You want to do any of that? Uh, where is that? Boom. There you go. Oh wait, no, that's not it. Boom. There, there you go. Yeah, look now it's double below me. There you go. LennySchmidt.com if you can. Venmo Lenny Schmidt Comedy. All John's info will be in the uh, description of the video afterwards. I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, I will be back on Wednesday. Another mobile show. This one will be from Wichita, Kansas. Uh, Tommy Savat is my com uh, my guest that day. Very funny comic. Also, uh, I think he, um, he might be from Boston as well. I think I'm not really sure. But uh, the rest of you guys, uh, take care of yourselves. Uh, have fun. Thank you uh, for being here. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being at the show. And as always, as always, people, do me a favor. Please dream of Pinky. Lenny Schmidt Quarantine Comedy was created, produced, and is hosted by Lenny Schmidt. We live stream on YouTube at 6 p.m. Pacific every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Special episodes occasionally stream or are uploaded on Tuesday and Thursday. Every episode is also launched as a podcast and can be heard on iTunes, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you enjoyed the show, please like the video. If you really like it, share the video. If you really, really like it, please subscribe to the Lenny Schmidt Comedy Channel on YouTube. You'll get updates on this and numerous other online comedy content that my dad produced. Check the info section below for detailed information on all of our guests. If you are a fan, you can follow and support them as well. Go to their page, like their content, buy their albums, purchase a shirt, any merch they may be selling. Anything you do will support performers will literally help save the arts. In fact, if you want to support this show financially, just go to LennySchmidt.com slash if you can or Venmo at Lenny Schmidt Comedy. If you donate as little as $1 or as much as $10,000, it will help pay for the stuff my dad keeps breaking. If you can't pay for the comedy content, that's okay. COVID sucks for all of us. Enjoy the free show. If you want to find a way to support what we do, just subscribe to Lenny Schmidt Comedy Channel on YouTube. That really helps a lot. Thank you for listening to my dad's show. And as always, dream of pinkies.